See, I'm pumped because you were just on with Chris and Kyle Long on the Green Light podcast. And there was a lot of positive feedback from that, man. We had people in our group chat like that was a great listen. So now, see, we get to welcome them to R2C2. Yeah, we get to do a crossover. We never really get to do these, so it's fun to you know get a chance. I got it, like you said, I got a chance to go on Green uh, Green Light, and now they get a chance to come on here. So it's uh, it's a lot of fun. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks. We're, we're excited. Up. We're happy to be yeah. here. We're get, we're just talking beforehand. We love being a guest because we don't have to prepare. We just show up and let our, let our talent <laughs> speak for itself. You know what I mean? <laughs> we'll see about that, Kyle. <laughs> you know what's funny though? It, that is like a very palpable and relieving difference when you are used to hosting when yeah. you then are just it's, it's like, like being the point guard and having to compute everything and like also score some and then just like waiting in the corner for a wide open shot and being like okay i'll, I'll, I'll just shoot yeah the Here's sixers don't hit any corner threes but um <laughs> but we hit our corner threes and uh, you know what's great is like you know when cc comes on like you know he he's an all-timer and i'd never met him until he came on and you met him in at, at the uh, party at what was the Super Bowl, but Scott like Hill. you know, you get nervous. You're like, man, do people even want to be on the show? Like you, you've had people on where you're like, damn, am I? Yeah, it's just would they rather be somewhere else? Like when you guys ask us on the show, we're excited to come on, yes. and uh, it's a real treat. So happy to be here. Well, I love hearing that that because you are right. That definitely goes through your mind. As yeah, no matter like, what, yeah, right? Even like, if it's a friend. No, it's so true. I got something to do today. <laughs> <laughs> so for you guys getting into this after, you know, both having long, successful NFL careers, what has this provided that maybe fills some of the gap that could be left over after your playing careers were done? Yeah, I mean, uh, I started this whole thing, green light, you know, with kind of a loose idea of what I wanted out of it. Uh, you know, I definitely wanted something to have to answer the bell for. I think that's the biggest thing when you finish playing is, you know, guys can struggle when they don't have something to wake up every day and answer to. And, you know, once I turned the mic on, then we built a listenership and those people, you know, on days where I don't feel like it are the people that I have to answer to because they actually enjoy the content. So they say, so it, it's, uh, it's, it's something to wake up and grind at every day during the football season is more of a grind. And then the off season, it's like a creative grind where we got to think of stuff to say every day, but um, I, I miss the locker room, you know, like that's the, you always hear guys say, you know, you miss the dudes and it's cliche, but we found a way to kind of recreate a locker room here, not just Kyle and Nate, my other teammate who's in here, you know, my buddy making from growing here, up, great. but we've got all the producers here that kind of become part of your team. And, uh, we like getting in the bunker and working together and then catching up with guests, you know, like staying connected socially with people. Uh, but it's fun, man. It's like kind of a blank canvas. And the fact that I started it and decided, Hey, I want to do it our way. Uh, it gives Kyle and the guys a lot of uh, wiggle room to do what they want. And as we grow, it'll be uh, better and better. So I just love it. I love coming to work every day and seeing Kyle. Yeah, I mean, when I'm <laughs> when I'm doing my, my gig at CBS, it's live television from 8 to noon on CBS Sports every Sunday morning. And I'm in a suit and a tie and I have makeup on. You do. And when I come here on Monday, <laughs> when I come here on Monday, I know that it's not, first off, it's not live when we're doing our yeah. Monday show. Like, yeah. we can be ourselves. And if there's something that, and I'm going to let fly like I'm in the locker room. I'll make jokes and they probably, uh, half of them will get me canceled if people were in here listening half of to my them jokes. Like 500 <laughs> but I can, trust, right I can yeah. trust my teammates yeah. here. Chris is the, yeah. the head honcho here and these guys behind the camera do a great job making you look good and um, that's why that's why we're doing this because we can be ourselves and we can find a way to monetize it and help people out. Chris just did his Water Boys uh, big fundraiser last week golf tournament, which my team won. Yeah, um, we, uh, we, yeah. We but can, can we stop here for a I second? I had the club champion on the team. Yeah, I, need the, I need the invite to that next year. Next by year, way. come on down, you're dude. You consider team. yourself invited. We'll send you some uh, some hardware for that. But like Kyle, he stacked his team. He had the guy with the club record. He had this other guy named Bubba who looks like a guy from Varsity Blues. You know the guy says tan, he's a, he's tan man. That guy he, he doesn't look like he'd hit a golf ball, but he's a scratch golfer. And then his buddy uh, Mickey. He I was got a few with. former baseball Rams. guys, uh, yeah. UNC, Virginia Tech, and then the one guy from our hometown who we grew up playing with is the seven-time club champion at this golf course. I, I found that out the day of the tournament. By the way, <laughs> my buddy just said he's really good. Invite him, so we invited him, and he comes out. 
And he's like, hey, good to see you guys. And then everybody kept saying, hey, Daniel, good to see you. Daniel, good to see you. Thanks for playing. And I didn't realize he's a celebrity. He's a celebrity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kyle Stack is team. Yeah. But, you know, we get to see each other all the time. And then we do softball together. Yes. And we do content out of that. It and becomes your life, yeah, really. Just like, like, you, you know, got this it, little. It becomes the rhythm of your week, yeah. right? Like these guys that you hang out with and. Um, the things that you do, like I see Scott Reinen, our, our producer here, and I, I say that's player. my shortstop right there because yeah. he plays shortstop <laughs> in softball. He always puts the ball on the glove for me at first base, and uh, he swings a good stick too. So we got a little family here, and yeah. you can't replicate that anywhere except for a locker room or a place like you guys have. Yeah, I love right. that. What's, what's, the, oh, what's, what's, the, what's the prep work for you guys like um, during the season? Like how many times do you guys do the podcast during the season and – is it like you have to watch every single game or is it you guys relying <laughs> on your football knowledge? So I think it's a little bit of both. I think, you know, when you when you set out to do this job, you kind of have to make it clear. You hope that the listeners know, like, what voice you're using. Like, you know, there's some people who are nonstop film junkies. There are guys that watch more and gals that watch more film than me. And they make that readily, uh, you know, apparent when they break the game down. And, you know, the, the, they're coming at it from like a, they have a very exact tool that they're that they're cutting up the game with. And, you know, the way I have settled into talking about the game is like I try to watch every game. You know, I really do. These guys around here will tell you it's like, Chris, are you ready? Are you ready to lay the show out Monday morning? I'm up at 2.30 in the morning on Sunday going through every game. Now, some of them I'm going to watch, you know, the condensed version of the game. Some of them are watch some end zone tape. Uh, but the bottom line is like, I want every fan that's listening to feel like we're not glossing over their team. So like, even if it's a Texans, no offense to anybody in Houston, but like, I'm going to watch that game and be able to tell you how Petrie played and, and how Davis Mills played and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, but ultimately the voice has to be one of, Hey, we're guys just hanging out on the couch, BS and breaking down a game, talking about a game. And I think that's where people enjoy our content is they feel like they're sitting on the couch with buddies who know the game a little bit better and that played it. And I think you can find really good, like if you're breaking down a baseball game, you could do all the analytics. You could you could talk about uh, numbers the whole time. But I think the intersection of where the game and like kind of stories, um, you know, intersect is where you want to be like, hey, something happened on Sunday. Me and Kyle have seen something like that in our playing career. And then we'll take 10 minutes to talk about it. We might not take 15 minutes to break down the inside run breakdown or, uh, you know, kind of uh, you know, how each player played, but we pick one thing out to give you something palpable that we know from playing. And with injuries and stuff as well, guys, uh, a lot of folks at home don't know what it feels like to have turf toe. A lot of guys have never had a hip flexor injury. And for us to go through every week and look at the injury report and say, hey, look, this That's guy's got matter. this. They're not talking about that, but that that shit sucks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And we have a unique insight like that, like you guys uh, in your respective sports and um we also get an opportunity to be fans of guys like we fall yeah. in love with guys throughout the course of the year we fall in and out of love with these players in and out <laughs> um and, and that's the great thing about our game and i'm a fan of like the bears so i, <laughs> I come in every week talking about how they're going to win the super bowl and justin fields give me the mvp eventually. we don't drug test here um <laughs> but you, you can have that you can have that crazy lens here and not worry about getting fired because yeah. you know people know you're kind of tongue-in-cheek but at the same time he's kind of serious yeah you we don't get held to the standard of uh, guys on nfl matchup and they know more about the game than us but we know the game pretty well and we try to just talk about it humbly and we're going to be wrong sometimes but we have fun hey, do, were you guys super close Growing up, have you always had the kind of relationship where you are genuinely happy to see each other every yeah. Monday morning and every day at work? We're very different. Yeah. We're like yeah. very different. And, you know, like if you ask the producers, they might be able to break it down a little bit better. But like our styles of work, kind of the way we are on a Monday morning. Like Reed, I'll how would you say we, we differ? This is Cowboy Reed from behind the camera. I mean, how they described it. Chris watches every game. Kyle knows what he wants to hit. And then they fly in, and <laughs> Kyle's, you know, Kyle's right off the uh, right off the cuff, and Chris has everything prepared. Not saying Kyle yeah. doesn't prepare, but yeah, it's no, a little no. yin and yang. Well, I got to run the show, you know, and like we're doing five shows a week, and the way it is, like I have multiple co-hosts, so Kyle comes in on Monday, he might come in on Wednesday, and I got to tie in. Hey, when Nate comes in another day, or Macon comes in another day, if we got all three guys in, you know, like I'm kind of producing the show with these guys, and so. You know, I definitely am a little bit more high touch uh, and I'm definitely a little bit by nature, a little bit more. I wouldn't say type A because I'm very disorganized, but I like to get, you know, I like things done the right way. And Kyle's so good off the cuff and also has the luxury of sitting in, in the studio with those great 
football minds. Like he's got Bill Cower with him on Sunday. He's got guys like that, yeah. Jonathan Jones, some of the writers. And, you know, like I think he takes that stuff and, you know, then you don't have to study as much. You get off the plane and you're like, I kind of know what's going on. So we come at it from two different angles. And then on Monday morning, of course, we come in nice and early and I've been up till three. Kyle got a good night's sleep. He's in here with a coffee, with uh, some breakfast, and he's just talking my ear off all Monday morning. And I'm like, Kyle, I need I'm five more. Be here, man. I need five more minutes. Everybody just shut up. Chris will come in and put headphones in sometimes. He'll leave just the room and be no, like, hey, no offense. I just need you to shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. It happens. But of course, respectfully, because he's we twice my size. Other, yeah. But we we have been, we were close when we played when we played yeah. when we played against one another and obviously I'm an offensive lineman and Chris is on D line so we would be nose to nose In and, the and vicinity. It, it, you know on the offensive line there's two sides of the offensive line and the center plays obviously in the center I was on the right side and Chris was on my side as well so it's a two on two kind of game we're playing between the tackle guard and the D end to D tackle and Chris obviously being a charismatic leader a guy who wore a C on his chest. He could have these guys tuned in to what they needed to do against me. So there was the love there, but there was also like Chris understood he had the right intel to get these guys in my head. And, and occasionally Chris and I would cross because they would run a stunt. And and that was always fun. We had we had joint practice against each other. Yeah, I'll tell, this, I'll tell you a yeah, story about joint each practice. Other a so I was in New England. He was in Chicago. He comes up for joint practice. And, you know, joint practice, we do some live-ish periods, that sort of thing. And there was one play where I'm looping underneath him and I beat him. You know, I just, I, I made him look like a Jake, uh, which he is not. <laughs> He's a very good player. And I, I go to swim over him and I'm, I'm clearing him and he whips around and does a spin move and takes his back arm, which weighs about 60 pounds. Hammer fist. And hammer fist into my ribs. <laughs> and he broke he broke my rib. No! He yelped like a dog. Too. Yeah, but I still had a sack. And, and, <laughs> well... <laughs> And that's the thing, like, fractured my rib, you know, didn't break. He sacked the quarterback. <laughs> he fractured my rib. So, you know, like, six weeks later, I'm playing, and I'm like, damn, my, my fucking rib hurts. That's like, my little I love you. And I'm, I'm, and I'm like, you. I'm thinking of him, you know, because. Uh, oh, then, man. And, and then there's other times where, you know, my best friend, William Hayes, who was probably my best friend that I played with, was uh, the DN that rotated in with me. And he was like, you know, like an all-star shit disturber. This mm. guy just. He he, he wore no gloves, no tape. He was out there. That make no qualms about it. He was out there just to yeah. hit people. And He's a heel in wrestling, and and he got <laughs> he got Kyle so mad when we played each other, and we had forty people there to watch us play. Like Thanksgiving, our, uh, all our all our uh, you know relatives and stuff, and it's in St. Louis. And Kyle, uh, I I'm on the sideline, and I see William, my buddy, just go flying. Like he looks like a rag doll, and he's on the ground, and Kyle's got him like a bear. And he's just, you know, like he's just, uh, he's got the no EK, punches, he's got no the punches. EKG on him. Yeah, but you tried to kick him, and I, I ran, I ran off the sideline, and like I've never moved so fast. And I grabbed Kyle by the the jersey to try to get him off, and Kyle goes like this, and the jersey rips off Kyle. So Kyle's oh. like so strong, he rips the jersey out of my hand. I'm holding part of his jersey, and I'm like, he's gonna get ejected. The whole thing. Luckily. He didn't no, get ejected, no um, but I still had to entertain all those people after the game <laughs> when Kyle was mad as hell. And, and the, the quote that I remember, uh, right right <laughs> after the scuffle ha uh, happened, we had been separated and the refs were between us and they were trying to get the game to happen again. You know what I mean? The after the stopped, chaos, yeah. when they're like, <laughs> line yeah. up, like, yeah. get in the huddle. And Chris looks at me and he goes, "You're gonna get that fucking FedEx, <laughs> which is which is a fine." And Cece knows what the FedEx yeah. is. That so it comes yeah. right to your locker, right here, but yeah, so non tax deductible. So we, we, I mean, we've had our we've had our our moments. Then there was times where I took him to to Vegas with our D line when he was a rookie. We went to rehab the pool party and we just we all got obliterated. And he was part of the gang. <laughs> that was the same group that seven months later I was you in a fall with. Yeah. So <laughs> so so. So we, I mean, like, you so know, we, had a blast we stayed tight, man. And, you know, it's good that, like, he, he's been able to come in here because it's hard to transition and find out what you want to do. And if I can help him at all, I'm, I'm always excited.
<laughs> that is an incredible story. I, I got to go back to the broken rib, though, because, I mean, that's like, is there any part of you afterwards that, like, is like, dude, that's crossing a boundary? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, because, you know, it's just a rib. <laughs> as funny as that sounds. It wasn't intentional. It's not like he dove at my ankles, yeah. like, or my knees. Okay. I mean, it was, he wasn't trying to hurt me, but he was, like, trying not to I was to embarrassed. Beat I was brother. trying to finish, you know? Yeah. So. <laughs> Oh like A Rod slapping the uh, like A Rod slapping the ball out. Slap out when he was yeah. running down first base. Yeah. Line. You gotta do what you gotta do. Sometimes you're backed it, into a corner. So I like, agree. <laughs> I said at the time people got on. Now that was before A Rod had won his championship here, so he was like, you know, everybody's favorite pinata at that time. But I was like. Why are we mad at this guy for trying to desperately do whatever he can to win the game? I, Instinct. Go for it. Not the, it worked before the umpires got together and, and overturned it. So I, um, I'm not sure I feel the same about what you did to Chris's rib. But I, <laughs> that just, see, doesn't that just show you like the mentality of a football player too? Nah, it was just a fractured rib. Like, no big deal. No big deal. Yeah. And later, six weeks later, I'm still playing and still feeling like, him. Man. Well, the golden rule is you can't run, you can't play. So if I didn't hit him in the legs, we're fair. We're yeah, fair pretty much. Nice. <laughs> I'm have to dust you up. It, oh, basketball and baseball guys have been out for three months. With that, with <laughs> well, there's more injury. skill in what they do like we just there you know like skill, especially yeah. linemen it's just like you just got to get out there and do it and you know they tape they, all your fingers together yeah club your wrist yep. these guys you know, these nba guys i'm watching the playoffs like of course if they get a little injury it, it throws their game off because it's so exact it's so skillful and the same thing with baseball we're a little bit more grunts yeah but but AD walk going off with the after the head in the uh, in the wheelchair is a little that's a little that's yeah a little you know uh, the last time I saw a guy go off in a wheelchair he had shit his pants that was Paul Pierce <laughs> so this was a little bit this was a better this was a better reason to go off in a wheelchair but yeah yeah that's a big Have wheelchair you ever, you ever just like Google most bizarre sports stories which you know by the way like ninety percent of them are baseball players yes. having the most like. Speaking, Speaking of ribs, ribs fractured a rib, sneezing. Mm -hmm. Like I forget what baseball player. There was a, a a baseball player in like the early two thousands who burnt himself ironing a shirt. While it was we talked about him. him on the pod. Yeah, really. Yeah. There was a Guitar Hero injury in one. <laughs> yes. Yes, uh, that was when I was Mike, in high school. Mike. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And there was yeah. also uh was it Mad Bum was riding motocross or was Yes. It? yes. yes. Yeah, what are we bad. doing, bad. bro? Yeah. Like, yes. That might be dumber than John Morant, bro, because like <laughs> yeah. that baseball money, uh, yeah. you know. The baseball money, you don't want to mess with that. Oh. You do not want to mess with that. I just feel like baseball we get bored, man. That's Mike. it. You guys got our time. sport is not super exciting. You know what I'm saying? So you always try to find shit to do to yeah. like to get that adrenaline going. Like, like ironing a shirt on yourself? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like playing the shit out of the guitar. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, get after it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Have you guys, so you're talking about um, just having your golf outing uh, for, for Water Boys, which I want to get into that at, at some point, too, because it really is amazing what you do with that, uh, Chris. But I, I have to ask, you guys both, like, I, I don't know, See, you've you've become like, obsessed with golf. Do you guys both golf a lot, Chris and Kyle? I I'll golf, ride I with golf more than uh, Chris doesn't. He hasn't really got the bug yet, but I think okay. I think he will. Um, yeah, and my dad too. My dad just strung together two rounds in a row physically miracle. for him. That's you know like Moses parting the Red Sea. Yeah, it's a miracle. Um, <laughs> so maybe I'll get these two out there. There's a real casual nine hole at our country club that we can play at. I'm gonna go probably nice. shoot around there today. I love golf. It's such a fabulous game, and um, I find that there's a lot of crossover with golf and baseball, and yeah. it starts with me that every course is the same. Like, there's 18 holes. There's this many par fours, par threes, whatever, um, and, and as a general rule, they're the same, but they're all different. Every, every ballpark's different as well. Um, dimension's minorly different, but, uh, you know, it's still the same ball you're hitting, and it's still the same bag of clubs, and the weather changes. Um, maybe the group you're playing with changes, but you're still playing against yourself. I think that's the beauty of uh, of golf, and as a, as a former pitcher, I can really relate to the golfers because the ball's in your hand the entire round um, until it's you know the the end of the game. Here's the big difference: I have two kids and a third on the way. You got one kid. 
Golfing is a tough like ask for me at home. Like, hey, <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm yeah. gonna just go out for it. Now I, I, I get what you guys are doing, not to pull the rug out from under most of the guys, do. but I know y'all have a real trick you got going where you're like, Oh, I'm just playing golf for business or I'm just going out to play around. And it's like going to the bar, you know, like <laughs> and, and outside. Yeah, it's like it's so, better than going to the bar. It's outside. Going to the bar. Yeah. <laughs> and and for me, Ooh. if I get three hours <laughs> To myself for four hours i just have other hobbies you know what i mean and so like golf is down the list for me now one day maybe i'll get into it what when, when your kids get older you'll get into it because that's the only reason i'm able to play as much as i am yeah it's because my kids are my youngest is 12 in school if i if i yeah my kids were young my wife would be like get the fuck out of here you're not going yeah. i go to the golf course every single day yeah and she and she still gets on my ass and if mm -hmm. I, we had kids that were young and had to be if i had to be around the house it would be no chance i would be mm -hmm. golfing as not much happening. as i do now yeah i've had no, that no, I i've got a 13 month old and i've had that conversation with my wife well she's had that conversation with me i'll put it that way <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's, uh, she uh, said, "Look, I'm all for you playing golf." She tells me, "You should play golf. If it's nice out, we'll wake up and over coffee." She's like, "You should play golf today." She's one of those. She's great, ooh, you know. Ooh, but, that's great. Right. Right. Really lucky. Kyle. But at the same wow. time, if I go play and it's 18, I come home and she's like, "You're not going two days. You're not going three days in a row." You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I can get, I can get a taste of the cookie, but not the whole, the, not the whole <laughs> thing. Nice, okay? yeah. It's it is funny, yeah. you guys. I got a twenty month old, and same like you got you got to pick your spots. Pick or have, your spot. it, like it helps when there's additional reasons for why I'm golfing. Mm -hmm. What you were talking about, Chris, like oh, like the it's good for me to see these people mm -hmm. or the entertain the, the these contacts. Yeah, mm -hmm. otherwise that was, that was me that, when I was I was a gamer when I when and we had kids right. and I, all I did was play video games and then. By the time we had our third kid, my wife was like, yeah, get that shit out of here. Right. Yeah, Kyle's got time for golf and video games. He's oh, good, I, after the baby goes down, right? You know, after the baby goes down, yeah. it's mom and dad, we play Fortnite. Uh, we get dubs together, my wife and I. Love and, it. Ooh, that's uh, fun, man. And then when she play goes down and watches her smut shows, you know, like, you know, <laughs> Ross, Ball, Island. whatever the hell, yeah, Vanderpump, all that Love stuff. Love Island. Yeah. Then yeah, I, I, I play Counter Strike, which is an old PC game that uh, you know Ooh. it's kind of an OG first person shooter, and I still play. Yes. And I gamble on the NBA till two AM. <laughs> <laughs> so not not hey. as profitable. We're different. <laughs> it's a it, it, it's a it's a sport built for that with all the different props you can have on points and rebounds. Mm. Oh yeah, and, I love and, it. And, and all that I, you know it, wow. it's funny though that Windbound time like it. when, when <laughs> you have the po when you have young kids though right that like post bedtime time that's oh my gosh that is precious yeah. the sun for, is still out right well, now after yeah. bedtime yeah. So it's like, let's go for a walk my kids are up yard. till nine o'clock my kid no, how old are your kids chris a seven and seven and four but you know my seven year old's uh, into the basketball now and if the knicks uh, are on you know now they're not yeah. on anymore but like he really nope. likes jalen brunson and i'm a knicks fan so he kind of likes to stay up so yeah i don't get a lot of time after bed i need to get him to bed earlier I actually I just did that game six between the uh, Knicks and Heat the other day, and uh, J Jalen Brunson was he was about all the Knicks had offensively. But how'd you become a Knicks fan, dude? Chris, just growing right? up, uh, like I was born in L.A. and wasn't into the NBA when I was a little kid. So you know, like my dad took me to a couple Lakers games, but I just wasn't that into sports at seven years old. And then moved to Charlottesville and right. didn't have like pro teams, so I kind of got to like repick my teams a little bit. And, yeah. you know, I just always liked the physicality of the Knicks and just they seem like because I was a Yankees fan as a little kid. So I had to be careful not becoming like front runner guy uh, yeah. <laughs> because the Yankees were really good. So I picked a team that seemed like the foil and like seemed like that kind of heel again. Like in the, and the Knicks to me were that and they were orange and blue like UVA where we were growing up and. I just loved all those players, man. Oakley, Starks, um, uh, you know, gr Grandmama, like the whole thing, Ewing. And I, we had Starks on the podcast recently. We want to get Jalen Brunson on. Uh, Jalen's probably my favorite Nick since those days, honestly. I That's mean, awesome, I was, I was a big Mellow fan, but I just love how Jalen Brunson, you know, kind of carries himself and just the 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 kind of killer instinct he had in these playoffs. But, yeah, it's just him. They need a shooter. <laughs> Wow. It was unbelievable. Like, it was literally like watching on the offensive end. It was like watching Jalen Brunson against the Miami Heat in oh, that yeah. game six, yeah. really kind of throughout the end of the, the entire series, but especially in, in that game six where 
I mean, that's a one possession game with seconds, you know, 25 seconds left only because of Jalen Brunson. And then he makes the mistake, so you feel I bad. Know. But, like, uh, you know, Jason Tatum didn't score until, like, the fourth quarter. You got to go in for the kill in that in that situation, and they didn't. And Jason Tatum, yep. good for him because he was kind of on the cusp of being this guy that you're like, man, he doesn't show up in big spots. And over the last yeah. two games, he showed up in a big way. I mean, even like, but game six, the, 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 how he had the, the bad four quarters and then shows up in OT with 16. Like, I felt like Tatum in, in game seven, I felt like I knew he was, I knew he was going to go for 51, but I knew he was going to have a good game. Yeah. Just because of the way he struggled in, in game six all the way into the Tatum, overtime. Tatum deserves credit for how he's played in these playoffs. But yeah, yeah, Jimmy Butler didn't score a lot late in that series. And so, I mean, I just felt like it was an opportunity for the Knicks to move on, but they would have got wiped by uh, Boston. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, interesting, man. And you know, it's there is something about these NBA playoffs. The the parity has been it's been fun. Like yeah, not yeah. truly not knowing who's going to win. Because for me, one of the things that makes the NFL so incredible and the NFL playoffs so incredible is you truly never know who's going to win. Yeah. You, you really don't. And and obviously, some of that is the nature of the sport and the fact that it's one game. But some of that also is the competitive balance. And in the NBA, where one player makes such a massive difference, we for so long just, I mean, for, for most of history, you just don't really have that, you know? Yeah. And it feels like right now, you have some incredible players, you have some great teams, but you also really have a feeling of like, I don't know who's going to win. Yeah. And, you know, it's why you get a seven seed and an eight seed in the conference finals. Yeah, it was like Boston's depth was better than Philly's depth. And, you know, you you, you know, like uh, the the Heat, they see, I mean, Tibbs is a great coach, but it seemed like Spo is just a hell of a basketball coach. And um, they might have got a little bit, uh, I don't know, I don't want to say outcoach in the end, but like, I, I think it's, um, you look at these Eastern Conference series and yeah, like Tatum's probably uh, the, the best player um left on the court if he wants to be and yeah like to get that that game six fourth quarter and the and the game seven that's like a lot of momentum for him going you're, you're a new yorker this yeah is i guess so he's a new yorker saying, yeah, I guess so. Sure. well i'm, I'm a, but the problem is because i played in philly my kids love the sixers and the knicks so oh, you know kind of wow. like just like me now so that's an confusing. interesting combo yeah. i just you know, root for lebron that's all i root yeah. for wherever he's at i'll get his jersey i'm i don't even care like fight me dude i don't even <laughs> <laughs> See me i like that he gets emotional LeBron. i've liked lebron since high school bro like cool. since i was i could remember i had the irish jersey um oh yeah yeah, same, yeah. Same yeah. Same 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 like yeah. I, i've been into i've been into lebron just because he was i I like CC can identify with a guy who is a freak athlete. Yeah. He's just bigger and better and faster and stronger. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like and as a kid I identify with That's him. Why I like and Jaylen then people Bryson. hated him and I I saw that people hated him and I was like, I like him even more. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's funny? I love that this is how you know you're dealing in a different world. Like you guys talk about each other like Kyle is this like freak size athlete yeah. the bigger dude and chris is some diminutive human meanwhile chris what you you were playing you know you're six three in yeah. life that's a very tall <laughs> yeah it's man. a good number in life yeah, yeah. you're 270 pounds i don't know what you are now yeah right? like 250 and, now okay yeah. he's a beast <laughs> he's a beast no, I, I, I don't even fit in a minivan now. no but here's the thing about kyle <laughs> kyle and you know like uh, try to contain yourself but as i talk good about you but oh, like God. uh you know, like everything he does, he's very smooth at it. He's very like, you know, whether it's golf, his golf swings, like impeccable, you know, like mm. baseball gets drafted football. He played, you know, almost 10 years and pro bowler, the whole thing, you know, like it's just every, if we played can jam in the backyard, he'd be like the biggest natural athlete out there. I'm just a little <laughs> bit more rough around the edges. Uh, and, and I've, I've had to, Kyle will tell you, I've just, he, I, I would, I always describe Chris as like, you know, like the GI Joes we used to play with as kids, like they had one job. It was just to like you know put the eye black on and go fucking you know <laughs> get the bad guys. When Chris played football, he had that same mm -hmm. demeanor, but he also could counter that with a personality um, mm. and a, and an intelligence that was really hard to come by in the NFL. When you meet a guy like Chris, I've had maybe a handful of teammates through the course of a decade that you know can really be able to vibe intellectually with Chris. I think people see the way that he is on the field. And the tenacity he brings, like I never, I never lined up a guy who was like had that look in his eye more than Chris. You know what I mean? Like it was Chris and like JJ, and uh, 
and Dominic and Sue. I'm just naming a few guys that were actually intimidating. Um, well, part of that like, was because I was your brother, and, and you he didn't want to fuck and, 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 <laughs> You know what I hear? And now I'm going to talk about Joel Embiid. I'll talk a little bit yeah. about this. Like oh. I hear him getting interviewed and, and the lack of accountability, but also just like he doesn't seem to me like he's in that elite shape that you always were in. Well, he's also they, seven they got, feet tall. But, but and, yeah. I'm telling you, there's a difference between a guy who is really in shape and CC. We talked about this last pod. Like yeah. if you want to go the extra mile, you can go the extra mile off the court, and it'll pay. Uh, a marathon worth it's of miles funny. on the court. I just ran my kids. That's what for the you first did though. Yesterday. And that's just, why the Lord gave yeah. you two Super Bowls <laughs> yeah. and you worked okay. so hard. Like, that that well, shit pays yeah. off. Well, I, I did. I just just ran Waylon and Luke for the first time. We played pickup basketball yesterday. I said Waylon, <laughs> I want to do something with you. Then we're gonna start doing this after every pickup basketball game. Kind of because I was hungover and I wanted to sweat. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was like, <laughs> we're gonna get online and we're gonna run these uh, these these sprints. So we go down and back twice. And he didn't complain once. He didn't complain once. He did 10 of them. The four-year-old joined in. We ran three laps around the driveway. It was awesome. Four -year -old and it, it wow. kind of, you know, like for me, it's like, how do you want to teach your kids? You know, and for me, uh, I don't want to meddle in the sports part of it. I don't want to be on the sideline, like coaching yeah. up, like, hey, load your hands or do that. That's what my <laughs> wife does, actually. She's in there over coaching my kid. <laughs> yeah. uh, but like when it comes to work, that's the non-negotiable, you know, like that's the thing that's going to get you a seat at the table. And then from there you do what you, I but, lacked that. And you had that in droves and I should have, yeah, but you, and somebody you got four it. Years you got in, it. I got, I got it a little bit at the end. I work, I learned how to work enough, but I mean, you were always the heart. You were the, always the hardest worker. And that was tough as a kid, but that's I just evolution, man. You I just relied have, on that. Yeah, I yeah. just relied on the natural yeah, stuff and yeah. it ran out eventually. Yeah. That's why you had a longer career. Well, yeah, I, I, I was like you, Kyle. I, was, I, I I learned how to work later in in my career, and I think that's why my my son, my oldest son, he's a he's a he's just a naturally hard, super hard worker because he saw me later in my career, you know, working hard and doing all these things to be able to stay healthy. But like his work ethic is the only reason I believe he's gonna play in the big leagues. He's talented, and he can play baseball, and he's been around the game his whole life. But the way he works at the game, and the way his mind works, and the way he wants his body to to feel every single day was some shit that I wasn't thinking about. You know what I mean? Like it was just all talent and just get me to the game. That's the Everything next step. He, uh, that's the next iteration of athlete, right? See, see yeah. guys who really understand how this works. And you three sixty five. You were talking about they teach velocity now, and they do it through med balls and explosive movements. Um, you know, the work ethic in general is just seemingly like yeah. guys are more focused on what the goal is. Yep, yep, mm -hmm. yep. It, it's so interesting you say that because that is something that is becoming clearer and clearer to me with this next generation of athletes who have this goal in mind their whole life is like if you talk to guys who are, let's say, David Cohn's era, see, right? Like where, like those guys are, they're getting blasted, you know, three out of five nights a week at least, like, and or cross country flights are crushing forty beers or whatever, mm -hmm. and, and then they're going out way performing. Bogged. That's just part of the way <laughs> box. Exactly. Yeah. Right. right, famous stories about him and beers on flights. Yeah, and, and and then they're going out and performing, and that's just part of the culture. Yeah, and then like maybe it decreases a little bit with like kind of your guys' generation of athletes, and now so many of these young kids like they are so dedicated to their sleep, to their nutrition, their fitness, staying away from yeah. any kind of substances. Right away, like they, they're learning this lesson as part of their training. Almost, it's really interesting. They see our dumbass generation. They see our dumbass yeah. generation burning out <laughs> quick. They're like, "Hey, daddy looks old, man. Dad, why are you? Why do you look like that?" My well, my daughter looks at old man and she says, "Dad, dad." And I'm like, "No." no. <laughs> well, when dad played, like for instance, dad played 13 years. But if you put the if you track the mileage, his mileage was that of somebody that in today's game played 20 years because. Cool. You know, like uh, in those days, the CBA six, was six different. Week training six camp, week full training pads. camp, full pads, the whole oh, thing. Yeah. And I think like the the transition has been this. Like, could we have sometimes? I wonder. Like, <sighs> put on a Raiders uniform in the eighties and done it, and like you know, just piece it together. I think like it's in there. Like you know, it's if 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 that's the reality, we're going to adapt to that reality. But the reality Four now four. is, it's working three sixty five, and it's working smart. And with all the the knowledge available to people, and all the fitness centers, and all the the football specific work off specialists, specialists like 
my dad was playing pickup basketball to stay in shape with the Lakers during with, the lockout. Like, he yeah, was playing like, with wow. the Lakers. Uh, like yeah. Lisa <laughs> Leslie, crazy. he was like contesting Lisa Leslie. Yeah, you know yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like putting a shoulder into AC. Ball, ball, ball. But yeah, no, like it's just things are different now. And um, we were kind of my generation was kind of the intersection of those two where we were working really hard and working dumb at times, but we weren't working h- as hard as them. And the, the some of the extracurriculars were just coming on the scene that had become available to us as athletes. Cool. You know, it's interesting. Like you're obviously you're in a football family, your yeah. brothers who played in the NFL with high degrees of success, whether it's your pro bowls or your super bowls, obviously both of you accomplished a ton in the NFL and your father is an all time great. And, and now has had an incredibly successful career covering the NFL on TV for a very long time. I know you guys get asked about that all the time. That's obviously, if, if people were going to know one thing about you guys, that would be it, right? That would be the yeah. family feud answer. What for you is actually the coolest part about this being a family thing for you guys as brothers and with your dad? Uh, I'll go first. One thing that stands out to me that's unique, and I mean, you saw uh, Travis and uh, Travis and Jason Kelsey's mom, Donna, get a lot of fanfare. Um, yeah. There are so many moms out there that happy travel, mother's um, yeah, and happy Mother's Day to all the late. I know we're late. Beautiful moms. Depending on time <laughs> release. Um, you know, my mom would go from a noon St. Louis game to a seven o'clock Chicago game. Uh, you know, routine. shoot, she'd go from Eugene to routinely. Watching, yeah, when I played in Oregon, Oregon, she would go from Red Oregon Eye. to St. Louis. Uh, you know, she's been going wow. to games since 1981, and, and before that, even she was in law school at USC. <laughs> When my dad was uh, first with the Raiders, and she was, you know, a, a kick-ass attorney in in Los Angeles, and you know, back then it was like must have been like legally blonde back then, you yeah, know, like just yeah. like a pretty blonde gal yeah. who was just smarter than everybody yeah. and didn't take any shit because she deals with. Was that Big the plot Howie. of that movie? It was based. It was loosely based on Diane. Okay, All right, <laughs> um, but like our mom's involvement is so much more than what you would think. Obviously, moms are supportive, but like you know. I, that that's the one thing that stands out to me that's unique about our family is our mom and just so the family you know, has to commit to the whole life and you know like you uh, all gotta be in you know like from being a kid and i mean hey we had a good man uh dad was able to give us something through football that he didn't have and you know i think the appreciation there outweighed the the inconvenience of hey christmas is not on christmas this year because dad's working you know, we we do Christmas like three days later or something. Come to school and wish kids a Merry Christmas. And they're like, that was three days ago. Well, not at my house. <laughs> you know, Thanksgiving, the whole thing. Like, you know, uh, and then on to playing. Like, I've missed some important stuff in my life because of football. Like, there was never a hey, what do I want to do in my twenties? You know, how somebody gets in their twenties, they got to make money, they have to support themselves. Yeah. But there's kind of this wide open space. There's no wide open space for us. Like, you know what a successful career is going to look like, and that means you're going to be locked in this box for 10 15 years if you count college 20 and you're just going to be grinding and you're not going to be going with the regular flow uh that everybody else is all your friends back home i've missed weddings i've missed you know my mm. friends kids being born i've met you know I've, i i haven't seen people for a long period of time because i'm out doing this thing and so like there's some inconveniences but the positives are um you know for me the as a as a player having a family full of football players is to me, it's the it's a double edged sword. It's the humility of, hey, nothing I'm doing is a big deal, you know, like oh. which is the way I want to raise my kids. I don't want them to think I was some special or that they're special because their dad played in the NFL. Um, you know, I grew up at a dinner table where, hey, my dad has a gold jacket, so chances are I'm not going to have a gold jacket. Neither of us are going to have a gold jacket, and then we go to play, and you're like, okay, this is the way it is. Like we're really good, but. Our dad is. It took some of us like longer to realize royalty. that well, we were not going to be our dad. <laughs> yeah, like, I think Chris, Chris, Chris wisened up early on. This is a really good and, podcast. And he here. was the number two, and he was the number two pick. I yeah. mean, he was Playboy All American. Everybody's got like seventy yeah. plus sacks, and I was like. Well, he can be dad. I surely can be my own version of that. Like, yeah. I, and then I went to the Pro Bowl my first yeah. three years. Yeah. And then I had the reality check of injuries. I had, you know, five years in a row. Yeah. And then it, you know, over the course of five years, the, uh, the it slowly well, there, came into my head that, oh, like he was really a special 
unique rogue well when you chase when you mm-hmm. chase him you realize how hard that chase is you know like you yeah. talked about bumps in the road like at say, one, shoot for the stars yeah at one point i'm <laughs> si- i'm sitting there you know six years in my career with 50 plus sacks and i'm thinking oh dad had 83 like this is gonna got be him i'm gonna get him got you know him. i'm gonna get him <laughs> I, you know like i won't be a hall of famer because you know the pro bowls and stuff you know i'm not in a pro bowl kind of place i'm not getting the accolades but i'm like if i can chase him and get the numbers that would make me feel pretty good and then you get hurt and you realize how hard it is to get up off the mat. And uh, you realize how, how special it is to put together a Hall of Fame career because you're trying to chase something like that. Whether it's your dad or somebody you, you looked up to, you realize how much good luck, how much hard work, how much skill it takes to string that together. You know, you see a lot of football players in the NFL and they have their three-year run. Like I had a three, four-year run where I was really good. I was one of the best at my position. But then after that, you know, like the injuries and that sort of thing, they, they really drive home how hard it is to sustain and new guys a stretch. In, and that's what a Hall of Fame career in. is, is not just being great for a year or two. Yep. It's doing it for 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 years, and that's really hard. But the double-edged sword of it is, hey, I would love to be one of these guys that says, I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. I'm the biggest thing in my town. Forget about your family. Like, you know, they got a statue of you, the whole thing. Like, and you can just blissfully ride off in the sunset and be like, I am the man. But I've never had that feeling. Uh, I've always felt like, hey, we did something good. We did something hard. I should be proud of it. But I've never walked around and thought like, uh, I should be arrogant because of it. And I think a lot of it is because my dad was so damn good and my brother's so damn good. And it's normal for us, um, which helps because you never get complacent. You never get you never get kind of conceited about what you're able to accomplish. So So interesting, interesting. that dynamic, like, and even hearing how real the presence of dad is with Mm -hmm. the stats, like, and and chasing the stats, like, I'm wondering, what was your dad's approach with you guys as you're walking in his footsteps to a certain degree, and you're about to do what he did, and he knows those are massive shoes to fill. I I remember when I got drafted to Chicago, um, and I I was at home for the draft, uh, I thought I was gonna be a third rounder. Dad had inside information that I wasn't, but he didn't tell me that. Um, <laughs> I got drafted in the first round, and he was kind of <laughs> like, you know, I knew it. We got to Chicago. Obviously, they're like, pick your jersey number, and there's the equipment guys are there, and all the media is there waiting for you to pick your jersey so you can go to the podium. And I was like, I didn't even think, I didn't put any thought into my number, and I was like, I'll do seventy one. That's what I wore in junior college, and they're like, that was Big Cat Williams number. You can't wear that. I was like, okay, uh, 74, Williams. I wore that Oregon. And they're like, no, nah, it's taken. And dad was like, do not wear 75. I'm telling you, you do not want to wear my number. I'm just telling you. Like, And I looked at the equipment manager. I said, I'll take 75. <laughs> 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 That's you, though. And uh, and I think there were some days that, that like, there was he didn't have to say anything, but I would put that jersey on or I'd walk into the locker room and I'd see it hanging. And I'd be like, I know what I got to do today. I, I, oh. I, you know, say less pops. You know, I could look at that Jersey and, and feel that. Yeah. Like for me, I never even looked at 75 cause I've always just wanted to do my own thing. Not oh. saying you're not doing your own thing. Yeah. You and dad are like the same person, Yeah, you know, like you guys have a lot of similarities and personality and that's a really good thing. Cause I think my dad's one of the best people ever. Um, but I just always kind of wanted to do my own thing. And so I picked, you know, a different number and that sort of thing. But my dad, you know, being the firstborn and playing his position and, and kind of just being the first to walk through that door, I think he was always, you know, nervous for me, but also he poured a lot into making sure that I was, you know, whatever Kyle said, a hard worker, all that stuff. Like I, my dad, when I started playing sports said, Hey man, like you don't have to be me. You don't have to play football. You don't have to do anything if you don't want to, but the if you're going to do anything, you're going to work your ass off. Like if you're going to play regardless piano, of what you do, you're going to work your ass oh. off. You're going to be the hardest working piano player. And so, you know, um, I can remember vividly being like 12 years old. My dad set me up with this guy named Ben D'Alessandro, ben who, D'Alessandro. who uh, he coached at Providence and UVA is a basketball coach. Um, and he was like, we're going to hook you up with this coach. I'm like, what are we going to do? He's like, we're going to work. And we get in the gym and he told him to run me until I broke <laughs> and uh, he, did. he did run me until I broke. And, um, I just think that was his intro into like, Hey, this is what it's going to take. And, um, you know, starting to get that bug of like working and wh- whether I was playing baseball, hit, taking a thousand cuts, that sort of thing. Like that's what he was talking about. 
And when it got to league, you know, he didn't put pressure on me. He didn't, you know, I, I think after the games, a lot of times you see our teammates come out to their families. And one of the things that would drive me crazy is you have a bad game and your dad's like, great job. Like, you know, the whole thing or you have a good game uh, and, you know, they don't get it. Maybe you didn't show up on the oh. stat sheet as much, but you balled out. My dad always knew exactly how I played. Yeah. And, I, yeah, yeah. you know, I'd be playing and, and I'd miss a play or make a play. And I'd think like, you know, sometimes, hey, dad saw that. I wonder what he'd think of that. You know, or what? wonder what he'd oh. think. Walking I, back to the huddle. Wonder what he'd think I need brain. to wow. set. Wonder what he'd think I need to set up here. You know, like where there's a pass rush move or that sort of thing. You can almost hear him in your head. Yeah. And it's like almost any, any little league dad over the years like that probably creeps into your consciousness but for me the confidence to know that, that dad knows exactly what he's talking about and after a game i make a beeline for him well usually he wasn't there because he was working but i'd make a beeline for the phone and just see what he said and he was always spot on and i don't need to be built up when i didn't play well i don't need to be broke down when i when i play well i just want the truth some honesty and that made me struggle with coaches sometimes yeah in the NFL, because not all of them are great coaches and not all of them really. And a lot of them are they're answering to upstairs. So you could play great and they'll dog cuss you because they're afraid to, to look happy after a game. Mm -hmm. And the opposite oh. can happen. So um, I oftentimes dad would help me, but then he'd hurt me in a way that I might not get along with some people that I didn't think had the juice he had. Dad, dad knew how to challenge me. Um, he knew how to get he knew how to fire <laughs> me up yeah. without. He knew how to fire me up in a very quiet, succinct way. Um, I remember when I first – my younger brother was a quarterback for JV. Chris had just – Chris was the guy playing at UVA, and, and I was in, like, ninth grade, and I was like, I think I want to play football. You know, I had never played. And I remember this like it was yesterday. He was like, football's not for everybody, big guy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he, was like, he, was like, he was like, you want to go down to Sam Beals and take some BP? You know, like you know, so whatever it was. Uh, Sam Beal was our doctor baseball around here. Like he would throw a million BP pitches Rubber every arm. day. Uh, <laughs> and and the, so that was like ninth grade. And then my younger brother became the quarterback of the varsity team my 10th grade year. And uh, dad was like, you know, if you do want to go, do it. I think you should play offensive tackle. Like he got me into offensive tackle, and then it was He's like just trying to hit the ground running. Alley. But then when I got to the league, the intro conversations were different. You know what I mean? He's like, "Watch ninety six. He's a rat fuck. Watch yeah. ninety one. <laughs> He's gonna go outside back to end. The spin move's gonna come from fifty six on third and more than twelve. He and, told you that about and, me. And he would text. That's not you, messed 56. up because he didn't. He would text me a list, right? And and I just like you know. A batter would get, you know, a, a scouting report. Scouting report. report. And I would tell the tackle that's playing next to me, who didn't study much, Bobby Massey. He's a dear friend of mine. And, <laughs> well, uh, and, and everything would happen as Flat Top would say it was going to happen. And yeah. we'd come in the locker room after the game, and Bobby Massey would say, the prophecy is correct. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be like, he would always yeah. say that, the yeah. prophecy is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Or it'd be like, your dad didn't write down the long arm move. Uh -huh. that he had. <laughs> <laughs> well, I get I, I get pages and notes, and then the, the one humility story, you, you got told football's not for you. I remember getting recruited, and I was like a four-star, something like five-star, whatever. And um, it hadn't I hadn't gotten the stars yet, but – uh, dad was dad asked me what I want to do. I was like, I want to play defensive end in, in college football, and I'm, I'd like to play at like a you know, Florida State or UNC or some big school on the East Coast. And he was like, I really think you should start working on your guard sets. Honestly, I think that'd be – and he was like, I get letters from all these places, and I got one from like Brown, and he was like, Th that might be your ticket. You know, like, so not only did he have me playing guard, but I think he, had, he liked O line a lot. But that also could have been a the way he he tricked you. Yeah, he could have been tricking me the same way. Yeah, <laughs> and every time every time I told him I wanted to try defense because you see these defensive linemen get sacks and big money contracts and they get he to dance, break his record. I was like, Dad, I want to play defense. He would be like, Stop it. He yeah. was like, You're not your brother. He was like, You're, he was like, he was like, you're, you're great at what you do. Yeah, and you were. Yeah. <laughs> that is true. That's our dad, oh though. He's gosh. fabulous. That is, He's the best. That is awesome. That is He's awesome. Best. First of all, that insight and those stories, that specificity is so fascinating into those family dynamics, which is so great. We could listen to these stories all day. You guys are fantastic. And it's why the Green Light with Chris Long podcast is so damn good, right? Because you guys are, are gifted natural speakers and storytellers. And it's 
It's awesome. I do want to before we let you let you guys run. I I, I do want to ask you about your foundation, Chris, because it, it's it's really look. There are a lot of people who dabble in philanthropy in different ways, and then there are people who give their whole hearts to it. I know CC with his Pitchin Foundation is someone who it really means the world to him and the way that he impacts the lives of uh, of young kids, and he talks about that a lot. And what the Boys and Girls Club did for him growing up, and and Chris, I know I was there when you got your Walter Payton Man of the Year award, and I remember listening to your speech, and I was just like, man, this is this is inspiring. This makes me want to do more and make a difference in a greater way. And, and uh, I believe Joe, Joe Harris, Harris, who's a friend of mine, Joe Harris, yeah, uh, has, yeah, he's, yeah, he's been, been involved in Water Boys as well, and and. And traveled for it, and so he's spoken to me about it too. But if you could just give us a little insight yeah. into where you guys are at right now, and and how you're making an impact, and why it drives you so deeply. Yeah. So long story as short as I can make it. I mean, like around 2012, uh, you know, I'd been in the league four or five years and was playing well, and had never had a foundation. You know, I, my wife and I always try to do things a little quieter. We try to do things off the books. Because I had this resentment of some people that I feel like do things for the publicity. Mm -hmm. And I just worried that I didn't want to come across that guy. It was more like yeah. insecurity as, as much as anything. And I, I just, as a pragmatic guy, I just had a conversation with myself and said, hey, you're leaving a lot of money on the table for the causes that you, you, you say you want to help because you're not bringing the fans into this. And um, that's the biggest kind of tool that we have at the foundation is football fans and and I remember when Jeff Fisher got hired, uh, he had me in the office. He had just paid me. I got a big deal. And he's got this this frame picture on the on the desk of him climbing a mountain with these guys. And I'm like, where are you? Like, what, what, what mountain is this? He says, Mount Kilimanjaro in East Africa. Uh, I said, man, that looks cool. I'd like to do that. And he's like, yeah, one day you should. And I'm like, I'd like to do that this off season. And he's like, well, fuck, I just signed you to this deal. Like, maybe you could wait. <laughs> Uh, but I didn't want to wait. I wanted to travel. I wanted to see the world. I hadn't done it because of football. And I brought one of my uh, kind of big big brother to my, of mine on the team, James Hall, along with me. We went to climb Killy, had a blast, met some awesome people, saw the disparity in the way of life and the resources that people have. We got down to the bar to celebrate. And I'm um, sitting in the, the, the bar there in Tanzania. And uh, I hear somebody call my name. And I'm thinking, there's no way. And I turn around and CC, it's Joe Buck. So wow. yeah, so Joe, because I knew Joe from you know Fox and then also St. Louis because I was playing there. He walks over. I'm like, "What the hell are you doing here?" He introduced me to this guy named Doug, who looks like Brad Pitt. It actually ends up being his brother, Doug Pitt. And uh, I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm that. like, yeah, I'm like, this is cool. Uh, what are y'all doing over here? They're over here for a water project. I couldn't go in the morning. Our flight had to leave, but it got my wheels turning, and it kind of mesh nicely with some of the things that i observed and there was this void where i didn't know what cause i wanted to get into so over the next month or two i did my research again very pragmatic and i think the 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 quickest way to change the world is through the implementation of clean water solutions uh whether it's you know agriculture whether it's saving lives whether it's it's a women's issue where most of the women and girls uh, in these communities are actually tasked with the burden of gathering this water. I mean, there's so many ways you can help through the implementation of clean water solutions. So I thought there's a niche in pro sports. Let me start this deal. We're going to do 32 teams, 32 wells. These are large solar powered wells serving four to 7,000 people. Um, and we shattered that. And, you know, I think it was, uh, you know, a couple years in Super Bowl week, we, we surpassed that goal. We actually changed to a, a people serve model where we're trying to, our goal is a million people serve through these uh, clean water wells. We're at a half million now. We've, you know, we've brought guys like Kyle into the fold. We brought a bunch of my teammates from around the league, uh, former teammates, guys I played against. Uh, we climb Kilimanjaro once a year, pretty much. Call it, it's called Conquering Killy with veterans and retired players. And we do a bunch of stuff just to raise money for clean water. The work we do is really important. Bringing guys over is great. But we also do domestic work as well through our hometown H2O uh, program. And there's just a lot of people. I mean, there's a few million people in the United States without clean water right under our nose. Uh, 750 million people worldwide. So this is a huge issue. 
Uh, and we do the golf tournament every year that Kyle stacks his team with ringers. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's just we, we, we love doing it. It's a good cause. And, CC, we'd love to have you next year if you want to swing club. Come on. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm in. Yeah. Waterboys.org if anybody wants to check it out. Yeah, definitely do check, check it out. It's, it's, it's amazing. amazing. It's, it's inspiring. inspiring. And um, makes, obviously, a remarkably tangible difference for so many people's lives. So, you guys, thank you. Thank you for being on. Congrats on everything you do off the field. Congrats on what you're doing now with your podcast. Easy to tell why you guys are crushing it with green light. Um, and, uh, and thanks for giving us so much time today. Thank you all so much, man. This is really cool. Awesome seeing y'all. Yeah. Appreciate, Appreciate you, fellas. Yeah. Thank you, guys.